Hi, this is Dr. Eric Yarnell, and I'm going to be giving a little overview of my upcoming course on herbs in gastroenterology. And <clears throat> just briefly to introduce myself, I've been a practicing naturopathic physician for 16 years. And during that time, I've uh, written two editions of my textbook, uh, Natural Approach to Gastroenterology which is now up to almost 2,000 pages and 10,000 references. So it's been quite a lot of work, and it stems both from my scholarly interest in gastroenterology as well as uh, my teaching uh, this course at Bastyr University and also, of course, in my practice in dealing with patients, which although my practice primarily focuses on men's health and urology, uh, everyone has gastroenterological problems, so uh, it always comes up. And I've had my fair share of patients that come in with primary gastroenterological conditions anyway. So in this course, I'm going to go through sort of all the major common gastrointestinal conditions and a few that are not so common, but still there's some potential to be seen and talk in depth about uh, the herbs that can be used to treat them. And of course, while taking questions, uh, with a lot of focus on uh, formulation. And there will be some case studies and uh, the anticipation that people will have read or have prior knowledge of the pathophysiology of the conditions so that I can focus on the, the therapeutics. And in this overview, I'm just going to uh, mention or talk about three herbs that are um, ones that I found particularly helpful, both in one case for a fairly specific set of conditions and in the others for a much broader range, as just to give you a sort of a taste of, of what the class will be like. <clears throat> so this first one is Fumaria officinalis, which is commonly called Fumatory, and it is now uh, there's big debate about whether to say it's in the Papaveraceae family or the Fumariaceae family. Uh, anyway, the Papaveraceae or the opium family, of course, is famous for its alkaloids, and this plant definitely has alkaloids very similar to that family. Uh, it's native to Western Europe, and there's about 50 species in the genus, but I don't know how interchangeable they are, so I have uh, stuck to using just this species. It does have these very pretty pink flowers with um, four petals fused into two lips, and there's just two sepals. It makes a capsule like other Papaveraceae family plants, um, and it really can be quite invasive, so that's one thing to be cautious about. It has a high germination rate and uh, sp spreads its seed very easily. As you might expect from having bitter or alkaloids, it tastes bitter. And you know, historically, there's a lot of emphasis on it being kind of a liver tonic and a bitter tonic, and thus being often mentioned as um, being useful in sort of a skin tonic. Uh, the word fumatory is a corruption of the Latin, basically for smoke plus earth, or another common name for this, earth smoke. And it's probably called you know, related to smoke because of its sort of appearance a little bit from afar. It has kind of a grayish cast of the leaves, which this photo doesn't do a great job of you know, illustrating, but uh, that's the best guess. And it is a plant that uh, Shakespeare actually mentions uh, a few times, uh, usually in a pretty negative way and kind of associated with um, intense sort of bad situations, so that's interesting. Anyway, I first learned about it reading in Weiss's book, Herbal Medicine, uh, and he, he described it as being a sort of a gallbladder balancer, that it can both stimulate and relax the gallbladder depending on what's going on. And he was most interested in it for when the gallbladder needed to be stimulated. So by chance in practice, I had a couple of patients who had gallbladder problems that I was giving the CERB to, and the, by chance, their GERD really dramatically improved. They're having a lot of reflux, heartburn, 
And they're like, oh, man, that stuff you gave me for my heartburn worked really great. And I'm like, uh, I didn't give you anything for heartburn. And so since then, I've uh, had many other successful cases using this, uh, but not 100%. It's not a perfect cure. So my belief is that it's besides having this kind of biphasic effect on the gallbladder, it also uh, has it on the lower esophageal sphincter. And it makes me wonder about other sort of liver tonics if they might have a similar effect. Anyway, I found it very helpful, very safe. I've used it as a tincture almost exclusively. Uh, I think the dried plant has generally lost a lot of its potency, so I haven't recommended it as a tea, although that was a pretty common uh, form in the old days. And I'll give one to two milliliters three times a day in a formula. Uh, I think there's some some of the concerns that are written about it are simply because of the family association and not from any personal experience or actual harm. So I consider this to be a basically safe plant, but one you shouldn't give massive overdoses of. Polymnia uvedalia or bear's foot is a nerve that has been almost completely forgotten. Uh, this one hails from the southeastern United States, uh, particularly prevalent in the Ozarks in Missouri, uh, and then east and south of there. It is somewhat in decline. There is another species called uh, Polymnia canadensis, and I just could find no evidence or support for using that. So one way to tell them apart is that the on the Polymnia uvedalia stems, the leaf tissue, or the petioles, excuse me, the leaf tissue kind of tapers down all the way to the stem. And on in Polymnia canadensis, the petioles are bare. But, and also there's a sort of more whitish color to the ray flowers in the Polymnia canadensis. Anyway, um, King's American Dispensatory is the book that I first read about this. And they say that it was sort of introduced into kind of general medicine by a Dr. Pruitt in 1870. And it's kind of interesting they know that so specifically. I strongly suspect Pruitt learned it from a Native American healer of some sort or from another doctor who learned it ultimately from a Native practitioner. Anyway, he was using it as an ointment and then as a tincture for rheumatism, but also for sort of um, what he describes as glandular swellings, so lymphadenopathy, uh, and splenomegaly. So I really, and the root is the part of you, this is the, that's used, and it has kind of a bitter, aromatic, uh, kind of resinous <clears throat> taste and odor that isn't particularly pleasant. Uh, but it is, uh, I liken it to Cianothus or red root, having a pretty similar picture to that. So I use this uh, fairly broadly whenever there's sort of a chronic abdominal problem where there's kind of enlargement or stasis. So that might be an enlarged liver, an enlarged spleen, or when I, there's mediastinal, not mediastinal, when there's abdominal lymph nodes that are enlarged. Uh, or there's just any kind of chronic issue, including tumors, uh, whether they're malignant or benign, and when there's fluid buildup. And I have used Cianothus quite a bit more, and it's more readily available, but when I've used the polemnia, I've been pretty happy with it. And I think it's a nerve that we really should um, be using more of and as a local resource for those who are in North America. Acorus calamus, or sweet flag, is a well-known and very important herb um, with many, many uses. And here I'll be talking about variety Americanus primarily, which some sources just call Acorus americanus. And as you can tell from that name, that is the variety that is um, found in North America. And it is distinguished from the European calamus in that it is a diploid instead of triploid in its chromosome number and in that it lacks beta acerone, which is a potential carcinogen. And in terms of identifying it uh, grossly, there are multiple 
midribs that are prominent in the American variety compared to the single midrib in the European variety. However, by far what is in commerce is the European calamus. And so that raises some concern about the beta astrone content. And that is because of rat studies in the 60s, which showed that either calamus oils or uh, beta acerone in isolation given in fairly high doses to rats for long periods increased their rates of cancer. Of course, uh, a lot of what they were using was actually the Indian variety of Acris calamus, um, which I believe is Angostatus. Anyway, that has a very high beta acerone content. It's actually tetraploid and really has no bearing even on the European one. I mean, as a comparison, there's like 10% beta acerone at most in the European calamus oil versus like 80 to 90% in the uh, Indian version. So uh, I really think this has been blown out of proportion. Um, and certainly with the American variety with no beta acerone, there's really no cancer concern. And even with the European variety for short-term use, I have a pretty low concern about safety. So um, this is an ancient medicine. It is mentioned by Dioscorides in his famous Materia Medica. And basically the name uh, derives ultimately from a Greek word for pupil, presumably because it was used to treat eye diseases, which is not really at all how it's used today, so I don't know how that changed, but it has a very spicy, uh, wonderful smelling uh, root, or really it's a rhizome, and the leaves also have this wonderful odor, and it's pr uh, principally and predominantly an aromatic bitter. So it does have a little bit of bitter taste, but it's more aromatic and spicy, so it stimulates the digestive tract. So this is useful for some of our most common digestive problems in the West. Uh, atonic constipation, hemorrhoids, uh, irritable bowel syndrome that is uh, predominantly atonic with constipation, not having spasms or pain, and all uh, hypochlorhydria, all these types of sort of atonic conditions. And generally speaking, people tend to get used to the flavor or to like it. Um, some of the side benefits is that it's uh, a nice sort of uh, antimicrobial, and it won't really harm the beneficial flora, but it is also useful for colds and flus and GI infections. Uh, it's an insulin sensitizer, which is a nice kind of side benefit. And it was also used traditionally uh, for periods of when people had to speak or sing for a long time to kind of strengthen the voice. And unlike in the digestive tract, it's more of a mental relaxer and kind of focuser, uh, maybe even neurotropic, so enhancing memory and mental function. So it really has a, a quite a wide range. It is, it is known, but I think it has somewhat fallen out of uh, favor and people have gotten afraid of it because of the uh, concerns about beta acerone. So as long as you know you either have a American variety or that you're only using it acutely, there really is uh, minimal um, need for concern in that regard. So this is just a sampling of how the class will go. It will be, again, or the class is uh, more organized by disease, uh, but you can get kind of the flavor of how it will go uh, based on these uh, these or to talk about tonight. So I look forward to seeing you at the class or talking at the class. Take care.